our vision is to build a four and a half thousand ton per annum plant uh, to uh, produce high period alumina in Johor, Malaysia. And the product we'll produce is uh, a four N purity, which is 99.99% purity, equivalent to 100 parts per million of impurities. And uh, if we compare that to a traditional smelter grade product, uh, such as our co op producers for aluminium production, we look at a, a purity of 99.5%. And really that impurity profile of the smelter grade is driven by sodium, which is retained in the alumina structure as part of the Bayer process. Um, we really require this high level of purity, the 100 ppm limit, uh, for production of uh, sapphire glass, uh, which is used today. And it's required to maintain a, a clear and pure uh, surface for that, that product. Uh, as with other materials in this space, as the purity increases, the price naturally increases. So when we compare, say, a smelter grade product at 400 US dollars per tonne, our material of 4N uh, purity will attract in the region of 30 to 40,000 dollars per tonne. And what are the uses for this material currently? Um, the, the two markets that we're targeting, the first is uh, uh, for feedstock into sapphire glass manufacture. And the second is the uh, production of a powder which is used in lithium battery separator sheet coatings. So just a little bit of information about sapphire glass. Um, everyone will know that, that uh, LEDs are uh, produced by depositing a, a semiconductor and electric circuitry onto a, a wafer substrate. And in the vast majority of cases, that wafer substrate is made from sapphire glass. Um, the sapphire glass wafers are produced by uh, loading high purity alumina into a furnace, heating that furnace up to 2000 degrees Celsius, then slowly cooling it down to produce a, a clear single crystal of sapphire. And that, that essentially looks like a lar large ice block. Uh, it, that's then caught out, sliced and diced to be used in the LED industry. It's also got other applications, uh, as were mentioned earlier, such as uh, smartphone screens, camera lenses, etc. Uh, the, the second product and second industry is in the lithium ion battery space. Um, everyone will remember from high school chemistry, a battery is an anode and a cathode. Uh, but in a, a lithium battery, uh, the other component is a separator sheet, which separates those two materials. Uh, and that separator sheet is required essentially to separate them and, and stop a chemical reaction which can cause uh, a short thermal, thermal runaway in the battery and potential battery fires. Um, a look at battery economics. Uh, we've seen in the last decade that batteries have progressively become cheaper and cheaper, and that's being driven by an increase in the specific density of the battery. So um, the, the batteries are getting smaller and lighter as a result of this higher energy, gen higher energy density. And what's driven that specific energy density increase is a shift in the cathode uh, materials that are being used. So we're seeing a, a progression to higher usage in cobalt, nickel, manganese in the battery mixes. The result of that increase in, in energy density is also an increase in operating temperatures of the batteries. And so what was typically just a polymer sheet used for a, a separator sheet uh, made up of polyethylene and polypropylene has now become a, a coated sheet to handle the operating temperatures. So the traditional polymer sheets may operate at 130 degrees Celsius. The HPA coated separator sheets that are now becoming uh, dominant in the market are operating in the order of 250 degrees Celsius. And we see that by looking at market volumes from producers of these separator sheets such as WScope in Japan, uh, whereby in the last two years their production volumes have uh, shifted from say 12% of coated separators to up to 51% of separators in the last quarter of last year. Uh, what's the global market for HPA uh, at the moment and into the future? Uh, well CRU have done uh, some recent market analysis amongst others. And their analysis was that the, the global market last year was approximately 30,000 tonnes, but they predict that that will increase to over 270,000 tonnes by 2028. And that's really still split across the two major end uses, the, the lithium battery space and the LED space. And CRU also 
did some analysis of uh, supply and demand uh, with the assumption that all of the current predicted projects would come online as planned in the next few years. And they still predict, predict a, uh, a global supply shortage of approximately 20,000 tonnes by 2021. And that's equivalent to about four of our 4,500 tonne per annum plants. And, and that deficit will grow to over 50,000 by 2028. Uh, CRU also looked at price forecasts and pricing information in the market. Uh, our financial model is based on a, a sale price of $26,900 per tonne US. Uh, their base case was about 30, 30,000 per tonne, uh, but they also identified a significant upside in that pricing based on the supply and demand uh, kind of economics there. Now, who are the global producers of HPA currently? Um, you'll see from this chart that there's two kind of key things to take away here. Uh, first is that it's quite fragmented. There's no one single dominant producer in the world at the moment. And the second is that they're kind of global uh, chemical production companies. So the likes of Sumitomo and Nippon Light Metals in Japan, uh, Sasol in South Africa, Baikowski in France, and then a number of smaller Chinese producers that service their kind of domestic market. And how do they produce HPA currently? Well, I, I mentioned earlier that smelter grade alumina has quite a high sodium content that's retained from the Bayer process. So to achieve the purity requirements, they start with aluminium metal. So they, they start with a high value feedstock. Uh, they use an um, alkoxide process, which is dissolution in alcohol. A lot of electricity uh, using hydrolysis process to then form high purity alumina. And where does the aluminium metal come from? Well, it comes from smelter grade alumina. So you have alumina being refined to aluminium and then form alumina again, which just doesn't really make that much sense. And you can imagine uh, the cost of production is significantly higher due to that, that process. So what Al Altec has developed and the, the value that we provide is we have developed a, a single hydrometallurgical process to take a aluminium uh, clay, a, a aluminosilicate clay, uh, through a single process to form HPA. So we have a low cost feedstock in comparison to the aluminium metal, and we don't require the massive amount of energy that's uh, used in that alkoxide process. Um, now the reason why this process is possible is we're blessed with a, a very low impurity profile feedstock. Um, nature has done a wonderful thing in weathering uh, the clay over time and, and stripped it of many impurities. So if you compare uh, the impurity profile of a bauxite to our kaolin resource in Meckering, uh, very low iron profile, titanium and other impurities which we can then remove in our, in our metallurgical process. So as I said, the deposit is based in Meckering, Western Australia. Uh, it's very large for our needs, so over 250 years of mine life. Um, the development there has progressed such that we now have mining approval, uh, works approval to build a container loading facility there. And the mining process is relatively simple. It's very soft material, so easy to dig. No drill and blast is required. And we need so little of the material to feed our HPA plant, we'll campaign mine that facility uh, once every three years. Uh, the mining will happen over a two month period, stockpile 150,000 tonnes of kaolin onto a ROM and then that will be continuously fed into the container loading facility. And those containers ultimately make their way to uh, Tanjung Langsat in Johor, Malaysia. Um, it's uh, right across the causeway from Singapore in southern, uh, southern Malaysia. And the reason the site was chosen to build the HPA plant there was really its, uh, its location to key logistic points. So there's three quite large ports in the area. It's in a, a zoned industrial and chemical park uh, where we already have uh, supply of the key utilities and key reagents that we require in our process. Uh, it's a naturally low cost uh, environment, both for the chemicals and the utilities that requ we require. And also the Malaysian government is offering uh, significant tax incentives for financial uh, foreign in investment in the area. So we, we're looking at a five to 10 year corporate tax-free window uh, for operating there. A quick look at the, the uh, plant as it will be built on the site. A uh, high level of our process. Now, this may look extremely complicated to some of you, uh, but I'll assure you it's, it's quite simple. There's 
five major steps that we go through to get from kaolin to HPA. Um, the first is the removal of sand, so the upgrade of kaolin to a, to a um, material that we can uh, leach. Uh, that material is then heat treated to activate it. The third stage is then leaching of that clay in uh, hydrochloric acid at atmospheric pressure and about 100 degrees Celsius. And that gives us a liquor which is laden with uh, aluminium. And that aluminium is then purified in three stages of crystallization. Um, and the fifth stage is then the conversion of those crystals into the final HPA form and some physical, uh, physical changes to produce the two products that we will market. Um, the chemistry, as I said, it, it's quite simple, but it's also well known. Uh, it's been investigated over the past hundred years, most notably by the US government in the 1980s. And at the time they were looking for a processing route that was an alternative to the Bayer process for smelter grade. There really wasn't a market for uh, HPA at the time. And so as a result, it really didn't compare uh, or compete on cost uh, to smelter grade alumina. But now we have this market in both the LED and lithium battery sectors. So the, the process makes more sense. Altec has taken that simple chemistry and developed a process which will produce the two key products that feed those two markets. Um, as I said earlier, we don't start with an expensive feedstock in aluminium. Uh, we, we own our own low cost feedstock uh, and we're going to be operating in a low cost environment in Malaysia where uh, our, our key reagents are significantly cheaper than they would be if they were in Australia. So we place ourselves in the lower quartile of, uh, of operating costs. We have a 10 year offtake agreement in place with Mitsubishi Corporation. Uh, they'll take all four and a half thousand tonnes of our production um, at the market, market pricing at the time. So that allows us to capitalise on the upside that we saw on the CRU chart. Um, Two of the biggest risks for building a project such as this are, uh, are cost and schedule blowouts. And I think that's common to most engineering projects. So uh, to mitigate that, we engaged with uh, the SMS group in Germany. Uh, they're a very large EPC contractor in, in Germany with a lot of experience and recent experience in Malaysia. And they've offered us a, a fixed price lump sum, lump sum uh, turnkey contract to build the plant in Malaysia. But they've also offered us uh, two guarantees, a guarantee on throughput and a guarantee on quality, uh, as well as becoming equity investors in the project. A uh, quick look at some of the engineering that's been done on the plant in Malaysia. Uh, this is looking at the container unloading facility and, and beneficiation area. Uh, as you can imagine with a German-based EPC, we, uh, we get their precision engineering skills, uh, but one of the requirements of the plant, because we're producing a high quality product, a high purity product, is that we use high quality equipment. So a very large proportion of our equipment is sourced from Germany. Uh, quick look at the economics. Um, based on our, our sale price at, of $26,900 a tonne, MPV is ha approximately half a billion US. EBITDA is uh, approximately 76 million per annum and our production costs are about $8.50 a kilo, giving us a, a gross margin of 68%. If we look at some alternative scenarios there, such as the, the CRU base case, we see our MPV grow to almost 700 million US. Um, where has Altec come from? Uh, five years ago, we were a $5 million uh, market cap, uh, grown to uh, almost 100 million market cap today. Um, Iggy's mantra when, it, when he first started with the company was not on trying to build the share price or build the market cap, but focus on building the project. And I think uh, over the last five years, the focus of the team has been on meeting uh, engineering and construction milestones, and, and naturally the market cap has followed. Uh, we're blessed with some uh, really great in key investors, uh, Mellower Group based in Malaysia, which have been with us for three or four years now. Um, the SMS group, as I said, and also uh, another recent German investor, Deutsche Belleton. Uh, so project financing, the, the capital cost for the project is approximately 300 million US uh, with additional financing costs such as contingency and debt service accounts and uh, working capital. The total budget's approximately 400 million US. 
And of that, 190 million has already been secured and completed with uh, a bank out of Germany, the KFW IPEX Bank. Uh, and of that 190 million US, 170 is under an export credit finance agreement. And for those that don't know, the export credit agreement is a facility in place whereby the German government underwrites the loan based on the fact that there's a very large German content. So in our case, we have a German EPC, a large uh, amount of German equipment. And so a very low interest uh, LIBOR plus 2.5% over 14 years. Uh, we also have a, a, a mezzanine debt uh, package in works with Macquarie Bank. Uh, we've completed the technical and market due diligence uh, for that, that facility uh, and they're in the process of finalising their legal DD. So while those two financing uh, uh, packages were being worked on, Altec made the decision to get going and start work on construction on the site. Um, so that's what we did earlier this year. Uh, we, we made the decision to... Uh, through a couple of capital raises on market, uh, raised about $40 million uh, to maintain some of the engineering and construction momentum, uh, also de-risk things like the permitting process, uh, site conditions, the, the weather the issues that we uh, were told we should uh, fear in, in the area during construction. Um, so we, we started a preliminary construction package with the SMS group. Uh, they've built the con uh, maintenance workshop on site, uh, some of the bulk earthworks, retaining walls, etc. And then the last piece of the project finance uh, puzzle is, is a $100 million uh, equity portion. So Altec's currently working on two options in that space. The first being a, a joint venture partnership whereby we would sell 100, uh, sell 49% of the project level for $100 million US. And the second being the uh, a, uh, a raise of $100 million in a German listed company. So if I can quickly just zoom through the German strategy and then wrap up. Um, th there's a kind of uh, growing pressure in Europe and Germany at the moment to invest in electric vehicles, lithium battery development, lithium battery feedstock materials, uh, largely driven by 2020 guidelines for CO2 emissions from vehicles. So we're seeing major German car manufacturers transition to uh, or, or starting to look for their transition to electric vehicles. And that gives us a, a big opportunity both from an investment but also a future development point of view. We've already been invited by Saxony government in uh, East Germany to consider a second plant there. Uh, our focus is obviously still building the first one. But from an investment point of view, uh, obviously, there's a lot of focus on EV and lithium batteries in Germany at the moment. We have the SMS and KFW name associated, associated with our product um, and, and our project. So we've looked at a, an equity strategy whereby investors in Germany can uh, invest directly in the project on the German market. So uh, we've taken a stake in a, a German listed company, which has been renamed Altec Advanced Materials. Uh, and we've sold them, them an option to purchase 49% of the project level for a $100 million raise. Uh, and part of that option is also a guaranteed buyback, which uh, ensures them a 15% return year on year after year six. Uh, and that, that year six uh, buyback, they also have the right to cancel based on where our uh, project uh, MPV is at that stage. Uh, just a couple of quick slides that uh, you can look at on our website if you're interested uh, generally in the structure of the AAM deal uh, and some information on how that valuation of 100 million for 49% was uh, arrived at. Uh, just to wrap up, I, I'd like to say I think we have the right feedstock and the right process to really capitalise on the growth in the two sectors that I talked about, both the lithium battery and the LED space. And thank you very much.